welcome to today's Health Policy Institute webinar. Um, I'm Marco Vujicic, the Chief Economist and the VP of the Health Policy Institute. Very, very happy to have my colleague Brad with us, uh, Brad Munson. Uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm a research analyst in the Health Policy Institute. Uh, I've been with the ADA for 22 years. Yeah. Um, and Brad is going to walk us through the latest and greatest data um, out of HPI related to the dentist workforce. We've just finished crunching a lot of 2021 data um, with some really interesting insights. Uh, we're also going to talk uh, about the future, where we see trends going in terms of the workforce, including demographics of dentists, um, and I think more importantly, what we're seeing in the shift in practice modality, uh, which I think actually is a highlight of, of some of our new research we are releasing today. So while, I, um, while we go ahead and, and get the slideshow ready, uh, let me just remind everybody about a few housekeeping things. Um, we are recording this webinar. You will get that if you registered um, next week sometime. Um, in terms of the materials, the, the slideshow, the new reports that we're releasing today, um, links to other reports that are referenced in this presentation today, all of that, um, if it's not already up on our website now, will be there by the end of the webinar. So you can go ahead and download, look at that today. So again, all the materials you're gonna see today are gonna be available by the end of this webinar. Um, the recording we're not gonna have um, till early next week sometime. Um, as usual, use the chat function for any sort of technical issues or housekeeping. Um, use the Q&A function for submitting your questions or comments. We're going to leave plenty of time for audience Q&A, and we're interested in hearing your reactions, your insights, your questions back to Brad and myself. Um, so go ahead at any time, punch in stuff in that Q&A box. Um, I also do want to highlight... Um, well, let's go to what we're covering today. So as I mentioned, we have crunched a bunch of data um, that Brad's done a lot of the legwork on this. Um, so we just want to show the latest trends um, and you know things like the number of dentists, the demographic breakdown, uh, age, gender, race, ethnicity, et cetera. What are we seeing there in terms of trends, as well as what's happening in terms of practice modality. And that's things like solo versus group practice. How's that distribution changing? What's happening with practice ownership rates? Um, and then we want to give, again, big picture takeaways and how we see things panning out in the future. I do want to flag, we are focusing today on the dentist workforce. Um, a lot of you ahead of time submitted questions more broadly about the dental team and, you know, what's going on in terms of the hygienist shortage situation or dental assistants. Uh, a lot of dentists having a tough time recruiting assistants and other staff. Definitely important issues, not going to be focused on today. Um, we've done a lot of research in the past year or so, um, both in collaboration across different parts of the ADA, our science team, as well as a DHA, the Hygienist Association. A lot of collaborative research looking at um, the hygiene, hygienist workforce. Um, all that's available um, on ada.org slash HPI. You can look at that. We've been doing monthly polling on dentists to try to get a sense of um, their hiring needs and hiring challenges. Definitely an important issue, but that's not gonna be what we're gonna focus on today. So this is focusing really on dentist uh, demographics, dentist practice, or practice models from the dentist perspective. Um, so again, just before I hand it over to Brad, um, look for the recording of this webinar early next week. The materials you're seeing today, the slideshow, the reports I'm going to show you, um, those are going to be available on our webpage uh, today, uh, frankly, by the end of this webinar. Um, use the Q&A box as we go on to submit your questions. We're going to have opportunities there uh, towards the end. Um, our talented team, Adriana and Sylvia, are helping uh, manage all that behind the scenes. 
And so uh, let's just get into it. Um, again, as I mentioned, we're releasing some new data uh, today. Here's a screenshot of some of the latest uh, trend data. So you're seeing three infographics here. Um, we did a, a deep dive into dentist retirement patterns post COVID pandemic, I guess not post COVID, but through the COVID pandemic, what's been happening. Brad's gonna share insights there. That's what you're seeing in the middle. Um, on the left, again, we've updated as we do every year, um, what's happening in terms of dental, um, the likelihood that dentists own their practice wholly or partly, there's some interesting trends there. And then all the way to the right, we've been tracking for years, the percent of dentists in solo practice. And I guess, spoiler alert, Brad's going to show us uh, the majority of dentists now are not practicing on their own. That's been a longstanding trend. So we hit a little bit of a tipping point there, but lots of details there. Um, let me hand it over to you, Brad, um, and go ahead and take it away with our latest and greatest. Okay, thank you, Marco. Um, this first slide covers the years 2001 to 2021, and that's on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis shows us a measure of the number of dentists per 100,000 population or what we sometimes call dentists per capita. And what the graph shows us is that the trend of dentists per capita was increasing from 2001 up until 2015. And since that year, the trend has been basically level at around 61 dentists per 100,000 population. Uh, that's it for that slide. Here, we're taking a closer look at just the last five years. That's what the horizontal axis is. Uh, the vertical, vertical axis is a count of the number of dentists aged 55 or older who left the workforce in a given year. And what we can clearly see on this graph is that in 2021, there was a, an increase in the number of dentists who left the workforce. And just as a matter of context, in 2021, that number of dentists who left the workforce was 9% of that age group. The previous year, it had been 7% of the age group leaving the workforce. So Brad, one really important insight, right, for our audience is we did see a spike or an elevated rate of retirements um, in 2021. And we think that's partly due at least to what's been happening in terms of the pandemic. Um, I, want it, I want you to all hold your questions because Brad is going to get to what the future holds here. So many of you may be thinking, well, does this mean now we're going to have fewer dentists in the market? Um, why isn't the supply of dentists rising big time because we have new dental schools that opened up years ago, et cetera? He'll get to all that. So just give him a second. But anyway, okay. big insight. We have seen elevated retirement rates. Yeah. And uh this next and slide. here we are. So, all right, take it away. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll spend a couple minutes on this slide. Um, the horizontal axis goes from the past to the future, from 2005 to 2040. Uh, the vertical axis is showing a, a measure of dentists per 100,000 population again. And this graph is from our dentist workforce projection model, which we released last year as a research brief. Uh, this projection model uses historical trends to project the future dentists per capita. Uh, the, in this graph, the years 2005 to 2020 are historical data that actually happened. In the years 2025 to 2040 are projected. In this graph, we see three lines and the top line shows just the head count of dentists per capita past and projected. The second and third lines, the ones that are colored teal and orange, show the head count of dentists, but adjusted to account for the finding that dentists differ in the number of, in the average number of hours that they work per year or the average patient visits per week. And these differences are based on dentist's gender and age. So when we account for those differences in the workforce in dentist's gender and age, we have those adjusted lower numbers of dentists per capita. And when you look at the graph, just as a first glance, you see that the general direction of the line is upward going from left to right. 
um, the, the, right, the numbers on the far right are obviously higher than the numbers on the far left, but there's an interval of about 10 years in the middle of the graph from 2015 to 2025, where the lines are mostly level and interrupting that growth with a, a period of 10 years where the lines are mostly level. This is happening because a large cohort of dentists who graduated around 40 years ago, that large cohort is now retiring. They're in the middle of retiring because we're about halfway through that 10 year period. And our model projects that after this large group of dentists retires around 2025, the dentist per capita measure will start to increase again. And one of the assumptions underlying that increase in the projection is an assumption that the dental schools that are currently in existence will continue to exist and produce graduates in the future. Uh, the model also assumes that in the future, the US population growth will continue to be near its current level, which is near an historical low. So that would influence why the dentist per capita goes up because the population is, was projected to not increase as much as the dentist workforce. Um, and by the way, this model was not affected by any early retirements during the pandemic. Our finding is that if any, if any dentists retired early because of the pandemic, they would have retired within the next five or 10 years anyway. And this wouldn't affect the scale of our model in which we produce data points every five years. So if dentists had originally planned to retire in 2025, but instead they retired in 2020, it doesn't affect the findings of this model because we have built into this model the fact that those older dentists were going to retire in the next few years anyway, whether it be 2021 or 2026. Um, and I should mention that this graph is just part of a, of a larger research brief um, available on our website, ada.org slash HPI. We have a research topic under our web, under our department, a research topic called dentist workforce. And under that heading, this brief is called projected supply of dentists. Um, that's all I've got on this graph, Marco, unless you want to uh, mention something. I just want to draw out because you've covered a lot of ground and look, is, is, I mean, Brad works on this model. This is a very empirically rich. If you want the details, you can go see it. But I don't want to go into those now. I just want to pull out the highlights uh, to our audience. Very, very important. So we're in a period now through 2025 where Brad has said there's a, there's a bulge of retirement age dentists. And that retirement volume is really high. And behind that, there's also a bulge of really young dentists that are coming out of dental school in our early career stage. So basically what Brad is saying is in the middle part of this graph, right? So from now through, through well, from 2015 through now through 2025, a few more years, we are having that big, big retirement rates that we expected given the age profile of dentists. But then behind that, Right, going forward, 2030, 2035, et cetera. Those folks have retired. And behind that is a significant growth in, in dentists entering the market and a very young dentist population that's got a lot of career ahead of them. And the point Brad is saying is also that COVID doesn't really affect these, right? It was uh, maybe people retired a year earlier, two years, three years, or five years even, right? That doesn't affect the long-term um, projections for the workforce. So really, really important. So that's the, the richness of this model, right? If we just started here, people be like, oh, okay, it's been rising and it's flat. But the fact that we do such detailed analysis of cohorts and by age and gender groups of dentists and looking at very narrow groups and understanding their, their as economists call it, labor force participation decisions their retirement decisions, we're able to say like, yeah, we think this flat period is ending soon. And we're about to see an acceleration in the supply of dentists. Now, as Brad said, there's lots of assumptions, the big ones being that dental schools open today will be open tomorrow. 
and that what the census is saying in terms of revised population growth, which is at historic lows in the U.S., will continue to be, right? So this is kind of absent some major baby boom or change in immigration policy, right? It's absent some major closures of dental schools or reduced enrollment. Um, but right. we don't see any of that on the horizon, so this is our best guess. Uh, but thank you, Brad, for highlighting complicated material in very understandable ways. So uh, let's move on. Okay. This next graph is simpler. It goes from 2001 to 2021. And the vertical axis is just a narrow range of the average age of dentists. This vertical axis only goes from age 46 to 51, because that's the range in which we saw the average age of dentists in the workforce. Um, the graph shows that the average age of dentists increased uh, from being an average of dentists in their late 40s up to a peak of age 50 as the average age of a dentist in the year 2014. After 2014, the average age of dentists started to decrease as we saw more influence from the increasing numbers of younger dentists joining the workforce. Um, and one, oh, there's a little evidence here of an acceleration in the trend in the last year, because if you just just look at the slope of the line. In the last year, the slope was steeper than in the years immediately preceding. Um, so there's been a slight acceleration in this trend of the workforce getting younger on average. I guess that's just evident from the slope of the line, as you can see on the graph. And that's understandable with the, again, a little bit of a spike in retirement numbers, right? We're losing older dentists a bit faster. Yeah. Okay, this graph um, along the horizontal axis, those numbers represent the age of dentists uh, from dentists in their 20s up to dentists in their 90s. The vertical axis is the number of dentists per a specific age. Um, for example, if you look at the ages for, uh, around age 36 or 37 on the graph, that's the highest point of this line. That means that the, the age most common among the workforce is age 36 or 37, it looks like. Um, that's the peak of this, of this line. Um, and uh, by the vertical axis, I can see that it looks like for dentists who are age 36 or age 37, there's probably about 5,500 dentists who are age 37 about 5,500 who are age 36. And then the head count of dentists per specific age drops off to the left and right of that peak. Um, and you can also see a kind of a secondary peak on this line uh, pertaining to dentists aged in their 60s. There's a point in the graph around age 65, and that's uh, part of that larger cohort who had graduated from dental school about 40 years ago, and now they're in their mid 60s and uh, in the process of retiring. Um, so you can see two kinds of peaks in the shape of this curve that Mark was highlighted. And uh, again, this is just a look at the entire active dentist workforce of all ages, all grouped under one curve. Um, a large group in their 30s and a second larger group in their 60s. Um, and uh, with your permission, Marco, if we go forward just one slide and pause on that slide for a second, we can see how the age distribution of dentists was 20 years ago. Here, the horizontal axis is the same. It's the ages of dentists. And the vertical axis is the number of dentists per specific age. But way back in 2001, things uh, looked very different in terms of the shape of this line. The peak of the distribution was dentists who were in their late 40s. You can see the highest point of the line pertains to dentists who were between 45 and 50 years old. And that again was that group of dentists, that large group who graduated from dental school between say 1975 and 1985. In the year 2001, they were in mid-career and, and evident here as the, the peak of this distribution, uh, the largest group. Um, 
and what we're going to do now is we're going to advance through the years and watch how the shape of this line changes. And there's a couple of things that you're going to watch for or that you're going to see when we watch this line change over time. The larger group uh, who are in their mid 40s, they will age and move to the right in the, on the graph. And as time went by there, we saw the growth of younger dentists in their late 20s or early 30s. And that's because of the 10 new dental schools that opened between 2008 and 2016. So let's and go what, backwards. Let's sure. go backwards now. So here's today, Brad, right? The, right. the chart you showed with a, a lump of dentists at young career stage and a lump at old age, or not older retirement age, not old age. Um, and let's go backwards instead of forwards which you showed us a decade ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. So, so there's can... that, you know, 45 to 50 year old dentist moving along, aging. And all of a sudden now what's happening on the left, right? We're getting a huge inflow. This is right. dental school expansion and new dental schools. And there's that retirement bulge moving to the right. Right. And now what you've showed us, Brad, is that retirement bulge is going to, you know, if we were to predict this forward five years, it'd be gone. Right. And we're going to have a curve that's got a lot of young dentists here and not a lot of older dentists. Right. 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 Okay. We can see the way that we can see the way that the curve is changing shape with the, the, uh, the line decreasing for dentists over 50 and the line increasing for dentists younger than 50. And here, with your permission, Brad, just because I know for our for our folks in organized dentistry that are joining on in state dental associations, Brad has created state level charts for this, and it's really different, right? Like Pennsylvania is an exaggerated version of this chart. It looks like an M, right? Yeah. Whereas uh, Nevada looks more like this with a lot of younger dentists and not a lot of older age, um, um, retirement age dentists. Right, My right. point being, right, just for our organized dentistry perspective, there's a huge generational divide in the workforce in the US, right? There are masses of baby boomer age dentists and there are masses of millennial. And frankly, it's not a bell curve. So as we'll see in a sec, it's a very important chart that Brad has generated, right? This is telling us that the generational divide is actually going to now really have implications for the model, the practice model shift. It's no longer a smooth, slow curve. There's a cliff of retirement age dentists, and those are associated with a certain practice model. There's a huge bulge coming behind that's young dentists that are in a different model. Okay, Brad, back to you. Okay, thanks. Um, so we could go to the next slide. And this is another graph where the numbers were lifted from our research brief on the dentist workforce projection model. Um, this graph was not in the research brief, but the numbers were in a table. And the horizontal axis goes from the past to the future again from 2005 to 2040. The vertical axis is representing the share of the dentist workforce who are female. And the line changes color here because the green line represents historical numbers and the burgundy line represents projected numbers. Um, the green line shows us that the female share of the workforce increased from 20% in 2005 to 34.5% in 2020. Uh, in 2021, that number went up to 35.9%. And the uh, the, the interesting thing about that is that in the past year, that percentage grew by 1.4% instead of the usual 1.1% that we were used to seeing in recent years. This was a trend that has been, it's basically a very steady, gradual trend. But in the last year, uh, the change accelerated uh, a little bit for the female share of the dentist workforce. Um, and going out to the year 2040, given the rate at which things are changing, we'd expect to see that by the year 2040, 
uh, females would represent nearly half of the dentist workforce. Now, if, if things change, um, that th this graph could be altered in the future if females continue to increase as a share of the enrollees to dental school. Um, at the moment, I think they're about 51, 52% of enrollees. I don't know if it's gonna level out or if it's gonna keep increasing. Okay, and in our work, we assumed it would stay that way. That's yeah, the, the maximum, model, right? Okay. For the, for the purposes of the model, I'm, I, I assumed a maximum that of 52% as the female share of dental school enrollment. But if that changes, then we'll redo the model. Okay, perfect. So roughly 20 years until 50-50 male-female split. Yeah. And as you said, we've already reached that in dental schools. Um, but that takes time to trickle into the workforce as a whole. Right, okay. yeah. Okay, here's a breakdown of dentists by race and ethnicity. Here, the horizontal axis represents the percentage of the dentist workforce. The vertical axis shows us dentists grouped by race and ethnicity. And the vertical axis also shows us changes over time. Uh, the yellow bars represent the year 2001. The burgundy bars represent 2011, and the green bars representing 2021. So we can see that over 20 years, the share of the dentist workforce that is white has decreased, while for Asian and Hispanic or Latino dentists, the share has increased. And those are the groups that have shown the most change in percentage points over the last 20 years. And this graph now has a uh, horizontal and vertical axis that are nearly the same as the previous graph, but this time uh, we are showing a dentist compared to the US population for the most recent year. Uh, the, the green bars represent dentists and the burgundy bars here represent the US population. And in 2021, then we see that the dentist workforce skews more Asian and white when compared to the US population. By contrast, the dentist workforce skews less Hispanic and less black than the US population. Okay. Um, next, uh, the 2021, the 2021 number here is fresh, but the general idea is uh, not a fresh idea. Practice ownership rates continue to decline for dentists who are working in private practice. And when we look at the same numbers broken down by gender, um, it's the same idea is that the share of female dentists who are owners has decreased over time. Same for male dentists. And across all years, female dentists are less likely than male dentists to be owners in private practice. Here again, we're looking at ownership status uh, for the years 2005 to 2021, but now we're breaking uh, dentists into six age groups. Uh, the vertical axis is the percentage of each age group who are owners. For example, the bottom line in Burgundy shows for private practice dentists who are aged younger than 30, the share of them who own their own practice. That percentage was about 25% in 2005 and down to 9.5% in 2021. In general, this graph is showing that first, that younger dentists are less likely to be owners. And two, that 15 years ago, younger dentists were more likely to be owners than they are today. Um, and one more thing about evidence of accelerating change for a couple of these lines. Um, we can see by the slopes of the lines that in the most recent year, the decrease accelerated for the bottom line that is age under 30. And for the line that is third from the bottom, the purple line representing age 35 to 44, the slope of that line, it's easy to see it has increased in the, between the last two data points. There is some evidence there of accelerating change. So let's pause here, Brad. Because you've okay. covered a lot of ground. And, and again, I want to draw out one of the recurring themes that's incontrovertible in the data. 
is that these trends are different by age. And we are about to see a de-aging of the dentist workforce. So you'll hear us, you'll hear me at the end say, all these things we've been showing you, these trends are frankly, they're about to accelerate big time. This decline in ownership, as you'll see in a second, the, the, the decline of solo practice, right? And the growth of groups and DSOs. Um, because of what Brad talked about about 10 minutes ago, right? We're at a point where in the next five years, there's going to be a big exodus of that boomer age dentist population, right? And, and I'm glad you highlighted the bottom two lines, Brad. Again, as I look at this, I was just orienting on the x-axis. I mean, this is 16 years. This is not like a huge amount of time. I don't know you know, it's, it's cohorts and cohorts of graduates, but to see the magnitude of these declines among the youngest age groups, but not so much the older age groups, right? Right. Um, it's, it's giving us a big insight. So again, as the workforce gets younger, as it gets more female or a higher share is female, look at these differences by gender, by age, right? So as you start to shift that mix of the dentist workforce and who's going into dental school, who's coming out, that is what's signaling us to analysts as analysts, right? That we're going to actually see an acceleration of these trends. And let's finish it up here with, with the last few slides, Brent. Okay. Here, the horizontal axis covers the years 1999 to 2021. And here, the vertical axis is the share of dentists in private practice who are in solo practices. That is, they're the only dentist in their practice. And at first glance, this trend looks fairly level from 1999 to 2006, between 60 and 65%. But after 2006, the trend declines down to 46% in 2021. And you can see by looking at the last three data points, that is for years 2017, 2019, and 2021, that the trend dropped off more in the last two years than it did for the two years ending in 2019. Uh, you can see the drop off, yeah, steeper in the last two years. And again, important milestone, right? The majority of dentists now practice in groups. Yeah, of uh, yeah, two or more dentists. Yeah. That's right. Um, here we're, we're zooming in, zooming in on the years 2010 to 2011, sorry, 2010 to 2021. Um, the vertical axis is the same as the previous slide is the share of private practice dentists who are solo. Uh, but here we're breaking out the workforce in terms of male and female dentists. And uh, similar with, as with the ownership characteristic, um, female dentists are less likely to be working in solo practices. And uh, in 2021, that was roughly 37% of females in solo practices and 51% of male dentists in solo practice, where the denominator is just private practice dentists. Um, and here we see again, how that accelerated decrease manifests itself in terms of gender, and not just overall. But there's an acceleration among male dentists too. So this is yeah. an important point, right? So the gender differences definitely are influencing the average and speeding things up, right? As the shift yeah. goes to more female dentists. But you look at the blue line, even among male dentists, fewer and fewer in solo, right? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they're both getting younger on average. Yeah. Um, here's a, another breakdown of the solo uh, statistic. Now, um, this is where we break out the dentists again into six age groups. I realize this one may be uh, small, uh, depending on what screen you're viewing this on, but we do have a larger version of this graph available on a separate infographic that is just devoted to the idea of solo dentists in private practice. Um, the, the graph would appear, or you could look at it at your leisure in a larger format there. Um, the point of this graph, though, is that the three lines nearest to the bottom of the graph represent the three youngest age groups, and that the younger dentists are less likely to be solo, and 
the declining trends again accelerated in the in the most recent data point. Here we just see the the same phenomenon, but just broken out by age instead of by gender. Um, with respect to dental service organizations, uh, this graphic represents uh, the year 2019, in which we estimated that 10.4% of the dentist workforce was affiliated with a dental service organization or DSO. Um, this numbers up from four years earlier when it was only 7.4%. Um, in 2019, 10.4%. And then we have additional graphics on the left part of this slide to show the relationship in terms of gender. Female dentists were more likely than male dentists to be affiliated with the DSO. And then the, the four colored vertical bars, the blue, green, orange, and gray represent different age groups. The idea is that we can see that younger dentists are clearly more likely to be affiliated with a DSO than older dentists. And then the large bar chart along the bottom of the slide represents how widely this characteristic can vary in terms of states. At the far right, Nevada in 2019 had about a quarter of its dentists affiliated with a DSO. And at the far right, we've got some states where there was no evidence of DSO affiliation in Alaska or Montana. And let me add, Brad, this 10.4 number and all the numbers here on this screen, right? We, we're, we're pretty transparent. We think these are underestimates just because of the way we count this. So these are, these are the largest. These are the ADSO member organizations. Again, we don't have clear definitions of what a DSO is. And as researchers, this is tripping us up. But the definition that we can measure consistently over time is one that we think actually undercounts. So the reality is probably much higher number. But again, the trends are clear, more and more dentists in these types of models. Um, and then for this one, Brad, to end it. Um, and this is what, uh, this is from research conducted by the American Dental Education Association uh, from a paper uh, from research on uh, the dental school graduating class of 2020. And the significant finding that the class of 2020 responded that 30% of them planned to join a DSO. That, let's see, let me reread that title. The percent of dental school seniors entering private practice who planned to join a DSO was 30%, compared to a comparable question in 2015 when only 12% responded that they had planned to go in that direction. So that's a huge difference. Um, and who's, who's answering yes to that question and just a difference of five years in graduating classes. Which again feeds into this, again, our common theme for today, right? Is we are, we are pretty convinced these trends we're showing you are actually about to accelerate. Um, and this is a data point that again, was, was surprising when we saw it. I mean, it's a big increase over a five-year period um, in terms of intentions of dental school grads to go into DSOs. Um, okay, um, Brad, I can I can paraphrase or read this. Um, great job as usual. So we had three big takeaways. Um, and again, I've kind of mentioned them all, but look, the latest data, they're not showing any new trends, so to speak. They're confirming trends and they're hinting strongly that we have an acceleration of trends. So again, dentists are getting younger, higher share female, higher share non-white. Um, and we think more importantly on these practice modalities, right? So solo, solo practice is, is disappearing um, and fewer dentists are owning their practice. And again, as we've talked about for various reasons, um, we are convinced that these trends are actually gonna amplify in the coming years. Number two is maybe our more important insight that maybe we haven't published so much yet, but those of you that are in this probably know this and feel it, but now we have pretty compelling data. We are at a point where there's a sharp generational divide in the workforce. There's a large number of young dentists in the workforce and a large number at the other end, retirement age. And if you go forward five to 10 years, 
that large number at retirement age is no longer there. So again, we're about to see a sharp de-aging of the dentist workforce um, in the coming five to 10 years. And Brad hinted at this, definitely COVID has accelerated some of these trends, particularly the practice modality shift. Now, I mean, I'm bringing in new data, but if you've been following our COVID related research, our polling, which was bi-weekly is now monthly, Another theme you've seen emerge is that the dentists working in larger groups slash DSOs um, generally have, have, we called it, they, they've managed the pandemic um, less disruptively, let's say, in terms of things like patient volume, right? Like patient volume returned quicker in larger groups. It remains higher on average than in solo practice in terms of patient volume post pandemic. Um, things like, you know, access to PPE, um, even hiring, right? Hiring challenges are different according to practice types. Um, so not to go into that, but, but hopefully you've seen that. Um, and, and that's why we think definitely the COVID pandemic has had an acceleration effect. I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of thrown gas on, on, on embers that were maybe underneath that are now kind of front and center. So with that, let's stop uh, Brad with the slideshow. Let's bring in Adriana. Um, and again, uh, I see we got a ton of questions in Q&A. I know we also got some ahead of time, um, Adriana. So I'll turn it over to you and, and welcome live. This is Adriana Menez. Introduce yourself to Adriana. Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, my name is Adriana Menez. I'm the Director of Operations of the Health Policy Institute. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for submitting your questions during the webinar, as well as in advance. Uh, before I go into the questions, I just wanted to remind all attendees that all materials that were uh, referred to during this webinar are now available on ada.org slash HPI. It's a blue footer on the bottom. You go directly to that page. And I also pasted the direct link to on the chat box. So if you'd like to access any of these infographics, data tables, they are all there. So and now for your questions. So many questions. We're going to do our best to get to most of them uh, during this webinar. Um, I'll start with some of the DSO related questions. Um, quite a few were submitted ahead of time. So Marco, if that's okay with you, I'm gonna read a few questions at once and then you can just address them in general. Um, so Brian asked, uh, is there any evidence of heightened dental practice consolidation at this point? Uh, Annette asked, what is the trend of new dentists working for DSOs versus private practice? And some of these have already been at least partially uh, answered during the webinar. Uh, Tom wanted to know the trend of DSO practice in the market and how that has changed the last several years. And a few more here. Uh, I'll just skip some of these, but Frank asked, any thoughts on why there is such a large differential in states and growth of DSOs? Is this related to the state population? Uh, I believe this covers most of the DSO related questions. So take it away, Marco. Sure, the first two Brad, Brad has answered. So, I mean, it, it's yes, largely to all of them, right? Is there evidence of increased consolidation? Yes. Um, does it differ by young versus mid to late career? Absolutely, right? And Brad has covered that. Um, in terms of what was the last one? Okay, let's see. Um, any thoughts on why there's such a large oh, the state by state variation? Yeah, okay, that's a great one. Uh, we haven't done kind of solid research on that, um, but I, I, you know, so so there's hypotheses, right? So one is one can say, well, obviously there's there's potential regulatory and legislative. Um, differences, right, in terms of like who can technically own a practice. That's a hypothesis. Um, the, the age profile of the workforce in that state is certainly uh, one of them. Um, definitely demand side factors on the patient side, right? So, you know, we know like, you know, Texas is a market that's been booming in terms of population growth uh, and people moving there. 
And we've seen kind of DSOs make a big play in that state. So there's an example. The things on the left, like Alaska, Montana, and that why we see zero penetration. I don't know. There's lots of people that have given me stories about, you know, private practice, solo practitioners are strong there. They band together. Um, so I, I don't know. Reimbursements, another one people have put forth, right, you know, are maybe DSOs because they're bigger and have maybe more analytics capabilities. Are they locating in places that are, quote unquote, more profitable, so to speak? Um, but look, these are just hypotheses. It's me riffing. Um, we don't have kind of solid research on that. So anything to add on that, Brad? I was, well, the hypothesis that it has something to do with the state's share of the population that is rural, something about the population density. Okay, there's one. And I think somebody just punched that in either in the chat or the Q&A I just saw. So yeah, sparse population versus kind of density of patients yeah. where scale is really an advantage, right? If you're a large practice, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so now I'm jumping to a somewhat related topic. Uh, quite a few asked uh, about the impact of student debt on career choices. So John asked, what is the impact of debt on the initial selection as a graduate? S selection of a career path, right? Uh, Carrie asked, um, it would be interesting to overlay dentist educational debt trends with solo practice trends. Joan, uh, what is the effect of the cost of dental school and the debt incurred by providers on top of an ownership investment? Uh, and I believe there's one or two more questions. Yeah. That's enough. We get the yeah. flavor of it. Yeah, these are great questions, right? And, and so now we're getting, you know, Brad and I have, here are the trends. And now we're getting at to, well, why? Like, what's driving that, right? Like, um, it is debt prohibiting people from setting up their own practice, et cetera. Okay, long story short, and I don't, I'm not saying this to be glib or, or you know, or, or controversial or anything, but my take on the research is that if we were to magically wipe out half of every dental student's grad or every graduate's debt, we wouldn't change these trends at all. So let me say it that strongly. And that's based on a lot of research we've done showing that debt when you do the analysis, has some impact on some career choices, but the size of that influence compared to things like gender, age, race, whether your parent was a dentist, is tiny, right? Mm -hmm. So in fact, we did one study that showed debt did not affect your probability of owning a practice which I know, I know everybody listening in, it goes against the grain of what you hear and a lot of, but that's what the evidence shows. There, in my view, there are fundamentally much stronger forces at work with the generational divide, with how young people want to live and work, who they're marrying, whether they want to be tied to a certain city or want to be mobile, whether they want to go brew beer at night or do their artwork or their side hustle versus kind of doing payroll on Saturdays. There's all sorts of these massive generational shifts that are driving this. And it's a mistake to think that easing the debt burden is going to reverse these trends. I want to say something even stronger. These trends are not reversible. I don't see anything as an economist Dentistry is heading exactly down the path of every other healthcare occupation that's gone through this transition away from kind of business owner, solo practice towards working in groups. And I'm not speaking normatively good or bad. I'm just calling it as an analyst who's worked in healthcare. Um, th this, this is not something that's going to change. If anything, it's about to take off. So again, lots of stakeholders are like, well, what do we do about this and that? Uh, my point is, so th there's a there's a maybe a bit more profound, bigger picture response to the question. But to the specific question, debt is not the main player here driving these trends. Okay, okay. thank you, Marco. Um, there are a few questions about the projection of, of dentists. And apologies if you covered this in the webinar. I'm going to read it anyway. So Michelle had two questions. Uh, does the increase in 2030 in dentists reflect any possible recession that we could expect in the next 12 months or, okay. No. 
But Brad, we doesn't did. it account on aggregate for the economic cycles or explain? Because this is an interesting yeah. point. I don't well, that, understand. That, you that, do. is a, that is a wrinkle that is part of the full research brief is that we have a, a graph dedicated to uh, what if there was an economic downturn? What if there was not? And then the, the um, baseline or middle path, which is what we publicized here, which is just averaging in the, the average share of years in which there was a recession, which at the time I, that we did the paper, I think was like one out of six years in the last 80 years. Is it one, one sixth of the time was devoted to an economic downturn? So we built that in as the baseline assumption. Um, but, and our baseline assumption then does not make any specific prediction of recession, yes or no. It's the middle path, which is the average of all the time in the past 80 years, where sometimes we had one, sometimes we didn't. Okay, thank you. Michelle and Margaret had a, another, like they asked similar questions. So I'll just read Michelle's. Um, haven't we reached gender parity in dental school grads? And if so, it seems strange to take so long for the workforce to reach parity. Do you have, do you have any comments? Yeah, in our, again, going back to the research brief on the dentist workforce projection model, we have a table that details uh, the workforce in terms of six or seven different age groups. And if you were to limit yourself to just looking at dentists younger than 35, uh, I don't have it on me, but um, the share of dentists who are younger than 35, a very high percentage of them are female. Dentists over 65, very low percentage are female. And it changes with every age group. The younger the age group, the higher the share is female. Um, on average, last year it was 36%. But that'll, it's gonna go up for every age group and that'll drive the all ages average up too. Okay, great. So that's a great, uh, I have a follow-up questions uh, related to ownership and gender. Um, so Kevin asked, you know, the percentage of private ownership, male versus female, is that really a difference of gender or more of an age related phenomenon since there are more older male dentists and fewer female dentists? And I'll read Catherine's question too. Um, aren't the decreasing trends of ownership also representing the increase of female participation in the workforce? Great question. So I believe the stat, Brad, we put up is not controlling for age. It's just looking at all male dentists, all female dentists. Am I right? Right. Okay. So part of that, right, would be explained by the fact that women on average are much younger dentists yeah. than male dentists on average. So Am I right that part of that will be explained by age? But have we looked yeah. within age groups? Is there a gender difference? Like if uh, I take dentists no. under 35, male, female, is there a difference in ownership rates? Did we look at that? I, I don't remember. I don't know the results of what that would be. Okay. So thank you. That's something we can look at. Maybe we publish that next year as a separate stat. It's a good question. Yeah. And maybe Thanks, I'll... Whoever, who I, uh, that person was personally. <laughs> Kevin and Catherine, thank you. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, I'll just add one last question related to gender. Um, Raul asks, on projected projection of female share of dentist workforce, what insights can you gain from comparing with trends in the other health professions, such as percentage in pharmacy, vet, uh, human medicine? Are female students not already uh, over or beyond 50% of the, those professions? I don't know if we have an answer, but I wanted to raise the question. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. I know, Brad, if you looked at this data, uh, maybe somebody else in the team has, but not on the fly. I don't For know. other professions, no. Yeah. All Definitely right. that shift that I talked about, I don't know, a few minutes ago in my closing comments, right? That shift, again, away from ownership towards employment the shift away from solo small group to larger group, whatever the DSO equivalent is, right? Um, like those, they, they've all gone through that. Now, whether that was in conjunction with the gender shift, the racial and ethnic diversity shift, 
a de-aging? Don't know. Um, but, you know, my, my guess is these trends are not unique to dentistry in terms of the demographic shifts. But how intense are they in pharmacy, medicine, vet, chiropractor? Don't know. Good question. We could do something like that to do a comparison. Another, another great suggestion. All right. Um, I have two questions uh, from Donald and Celeste uh, related to the relevance of supply of dentists, of the number of dentists. So Donald asked, um, are the real underlining dental health needs only under the umbrella of the dental manpower? Are we asking the right questions? And Celeste asked, as changes occur in practice dynamics and solo practices, are trends going to address access to care for rural and underserved? Okay, good. They're, those are kind of in the same vein. Um, so I, I guess for, okay, the narrow answer to that is we, 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 that, well, that's not something we're covering today, right? Like we're just describing the trends. Now they're excellent questions. They're saying, what are the implications of those trends? right, to things like access to care or dentists in rural areas. The first question was, um, okay, is it enough to look at dentists? The answer, obviously, there is no, right? There's a whole bunch of other, you know, dental team members, um, you know, hygienists, assistants uh, in a few states, dental therapists, you name it, outreach workers, CDHCs, community dental health coordinators, all these are part of kind of the, the oral health workforce. And I'm sure I'm missing some because I'm not a dentist. Um, so we'd love to do all that. We're biting off one piece at a time. Again, we've done, which I think is a huge advancement. We've done now some pretty intense work with hygienists in partnership with the ADHA, which is great. We want to expand our work for a whole bunch of other cadres of healthcare workers. Um, so thanks. I think that was Donald, right? Uh, and the second one, yeah, th th w it's interesting. I don't know, Brad, let's think. What are the implications if there are any for access or rural practices? Like for example, a simple thing, like if there are more women coming into the workforce, does this affect geographic location of practices? I don't know. I could see a hypothesis going both ways. Um, yeah. what, what, if it's, what if it's kind of older solo dentists that really are the only providers in rural areas and now they're gonna retire? Are they going to be replaced by young millennials and DSOs in rural Montana? Very good question. I don't know. Um, so th that's a whole other research agenda. But I don't know. Predict or give us some hypothesis, Brad. You've thought about this too. Um, well, it, it raises, not that I have any answers, but it just raises a related question of whether a state needs to offer incentives when it comes to locating dentists, because the natural inclination is to go where the money is, but the cities are full of dentists already. Yeah, um, We know, it just, this is not a slide, but I've seen in other research that I've done that dentist per capita is highest in Metro counties. But more important, Brad, you've shown me this, right? It's actually rising in metro areas that already have a high supply of dentists. We've done nothing the last 20 years to change the dentist per capita in rural areas. I remember you've shown that, me something like right, that. Right, the trend over time, I guess it was like a 10 or 20 year trend. Uh, the, yeah. the, the dentist per capita in rural counties was basically unchanged. unchanged. Yeah. Um, now, of course, that experience could differ in a specific state if they are possibly uh, affecting policies to fix that, it could change in a specific state. Uh, I don't have a lot of state level numbers. Yeah. No. All right. Yeah, we have a lot of unanswered questions, but we've reached 1 p.m., which is the end of our webinar. Uh, our team is gonna do our best to reach out to you directly with some answers for most of these questions, both, of, both questions answer, uh, asked here during the webinar or in advance. Um, and Marco, I'll, I'll give the, the floor to you to close the webinar. Well, I mean, as you all hopefully can appreciate, we have an amazing team at HPI. Uh, Brad, thank you so much for, for analyzing the latest data, helping us tease out the insights. Um, 
And I'm just so lucky to work with, you know, four of you and everybody else in the HPI team. Sylvia, thank you so much. She's still behind the scenes. Uh, Adriana and Brad, it's just a pleasure to have you at the ADA and with HPI. And look, thanks to the audience. I wish we could go on and on. This is, this is great insights and suggestions for future research. Um, we'll take it. Um, and just, again, a lot of gratitude for the group. Um, pleasure to work with all of you. And thanks to the audience. We'll see you further up the road. Um, we got a lot of exciting stuff forthcoming in the next month or two. So enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for joining.